Good evening, and welcome to the Eugene Public Library and the Windfall Reading Series. My name is Matt Matias Torres, and I want to thank you all for coming tonight, virtually that is. Thank you also to our sponsors, the Lane Literary Guild, Friends of the Library, the Library Foundation, and the City, City of Eugene Cultural Services Division. Before we get started tonight, <laughs> a couple of housekeeping items. At the end of our program, there will be a chance to ask questions. Um, we ask that if you have any questions during our readings that you place them in YouTube if you have uh, an account with YouTube. If you don't have an account with YouTube, I will be placing my email address within the stream and you can definitely have that opportunity to email me a question, and I'll make sure that we have time to answer it at the end. We don't intend to have a break between our readers, so we just want to prepare you for that. It, it, we'll have a short short interlude where Henry with Lane the Rear Guild will um, be there for the break, and he'll kind of be that person that will kind of lead us from one reader to the next. At this time, I want to sincerely thank all in attendance. Um, it's very different uh, presenting Windfall through this format. And I want to thank you all for um, being with us to, this evening and kind of seeing how it goes. Um, at this time, I'd like to welcome Henry Alley with the Lane Literary Guild, who will introduce our first reader. So I'm going to bring up Henry. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for coming. And I, I just want to say that we're really honored to be able to launch another series of windfall readings. Uh, this is a tradition that's been going on since the 1990s, and we really believe in what we're doing, and we're just really, really happy that you came tonight and that we're going to continue this from this month all the way to May. And the new format that we have here is possible, made possible through the really hard workings of Matthias Torres, who just spoke. And we're so, we're so grateful to him for working with us. Uh, the Lane Literary Guild has been going since 1984. And the series, as I said, uh, this particular reading series has been going since the 1990s. We put two people together, um, distinguished local and regional writers, and this time we are very honored to have uh, Sabina Stark and also David Axelrod. I would also like to say that these, both these people have wonderful books and they are available or can be um, tracked down through our great local literary bookstore, Tsunami Books. And at the end, we'll put the phone number for that bookstore up on the screen so you can call them and see what's available of their writing. Uh, tonight, we're going to uh, have, as I said, Sabina Stark uh, for prose, and we're going to have a Dable Axelrod for poetry. And we're going to start tonight with uh, Sabina Stark. And Sabina Stark has published prose and poetry in a number of literary journals, and in the anthology Before There Was Nowhere to Stand, which includes her poem, High Holy Days. A longtime musician and composer, she wrote the song Learning How to Fly, which was recorded by Tuck and Patty. A daughter of immigrants and a graduate of the University of Oregon School of Journalism's literary nonfiction program, she was awarded an Oregon Literary Arts Fellowship for her book in progress. Uh, and I just want to say um, I have known uh, Sabina for years, and I know 
that she makes not only a contribution to our world of letters here, but also to the world of the community at large. Uh, she has written um, in her member spotlight on our Lane Writers Network, I work for and I write toward the time that we human beings will see ourselves as we really are members of one extended human family. And I recommend that you visit our Lane Writers Network, which is I'll mention more of at the end, but she is a, a member spotlight has appeared on that website. So without further ado, I will welcome Sabina Stark. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, this evening. Mm -hmm. I especially want to thank Henry Alley and Sherry Wellborn and all the organizers of the Lane Literary Guild and Matthias Torres of the Eugene Public Library for hosting our reading tonight. Uh, it's really, um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to share some of my work um, during a time of worldwide pandemic and the disastrous wildfires that, that we're all um, experiencing now. Um, I'm gonna read a section of my memoir and it's, um, it's a chapter called City Light yeah, I think they, yeah, they that the in my late 20s, I joined a self-led support group of daughters of Holocaust survivors, and we worked together for two years. Uh, there were 16 of us. <laughs> and this excerpt describes some of the stories that I shared uh, my discoveries during that time. And I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, some names have been changed to protect people's privacy. Um, so I begin this chapter with an epigraph. But when I lean over the chasm of myself, it seems my God is dark and like a web, a hundred roots silently drinking. This is the ferment I grow out of. More I don't know because my branches rest in deep silence, stirred only by the wind. And that's Reina Maria Rilke from the Book of a Monastic Life. My mother stood in the kitchen gutting a raw chicken with a long boning knife. When my father accused her of something, something I didn't understand, he addressed her in Russian instead of Yiddish to keep my sister and me out of the conversation. She ignored him at first, but he continued berating her in an increasingly sarcastic tone. Get away from me, she said, leave me alone, but he wouldn't. She stopped cutting up the bird and faced him, waving the knife. As he came closer to her, she took hold of the knife with its blade pointing toward his neck. Mamza, bastard, shut up and get away from me, she said. Sonyachka, he mocked her. That name was a harsh Russian diminutive, which he used only when he was angry. My older sister, wise at the ripe old age of eight, disappeared into the background as she always did when the two of them fought. But I ran toward the kitchen, shrieking. My mother aimed the knife at my father's face, stabbing at the air. Leave me alone, I said, or I'll kill you. Get away from me. She could almost touch him with the end of the knife. My father edged closer, yelling curses. I'll kill you. I'll kill you if you don't stop bothering me. She was poised to attack, her face tense, eyes focused. Her expression was unforgettable. I knew she meant it. She would kill him. She would stab him with the knife. He finally lowered his voice and backed away. And as if nothing had happened, she resumed preparing dinner. After that night, at the start of every argument, I rushed into the kitchen collected the knives out of the silverware drawer and shoved them under my parents' bed where I imagined they couldn't reach them. Sometimes I grabbed forks too, anything sharp or pointy, anything that could be used as a weapon. I thought it was my job to stop them from killing each other. My assumption that they might kill each other wasn't very far off because what began as bouts of cursing and threats frequently led to physical violence. My mother hurled whatever objects she could reach at my father. Plates shattered against the kitchen wall. A frying pan flew across the room and landed with a crash. Sometimes she managed to hit her mark. Eventually, he would stop her. And if we got in the way, my sister and I were hit. My mother fought back, 
punching and swearing at him, but at five foot nothing, she was out muscled and overpowered by my equally compact but stronger father. If I didn't intervene by causing some kind of disturbance to draw their attention as I felt compelled to do, my father would eventually whack my mother across her small face with his thick hand and she would tumble and land sprawled on the floor, sobbing and sobbing like a baby, emptied of the rage that sustained her and the fight would end. In May, 1946, my parents left a dis displaced persons camp outside of Munich to travel to the port of Bremenhofen. A few weeks later, they disembarked from the SS Marina Persch in New York City. Both of them enrolled in training and were soon working factory jobs, operating sweater knitting machines. But my father often thought that the strangers around him were Nazi collaborators. He confronted his presumed enemies and got into fights. When the work orders slowed down that winter, the owner let him go. One evening, I stood frozen beside my father in the narrow hallway outside our fifth floor, Lower East Side apartment while he shouted at the other tenants, you better keep away from my family. Do you hear me? Keep away from us. A dozen scared and curious faces peered out from behind half open doors and looked up at us through the stairwell from the floors below as my father roared and shook his clenched fist toward all of them. My father went from job to job, getting fired or walking out. He was a fuller brush man, a metal press operator, a yards good salesman. He ran a commission bakery stand at the Essex Street Market in Manhattan and a luncheonette in Hillside, New Jersey. Inside our home, he would have fits of rage and tears. Sometimes he banged his head on the wall, trying to end his suffering. He seemed to be asking, why do I have to live? I could never anticipate what might ignite him. Something my mother said, something my sister or I did or didn't do. When he became lost in one of these desperate explosions, I felt terrified, helpless to stop him. On good days, he was affectionate and told us stories. He sat with me at the kitchen table where we colored in my Three Stooges coloring book together. He let me win game after game of checkers, took me out to play basketball with him, and carried me on his shoulders up and down the many flights of apartment stairs. He was daddy. When I was very young, I asked my parents about their childhoods. Tell me about when you were my age, I said. I learned that as a young boy, my father was known to hide in the hayloft of the family's barn, reading poetry books, when he was supposed to be helping his father in their grocery store. My mother told us that she didn't learn to cook as a young girl because her mother insisted that she devote all of her attention to her schoolwork and to read at least 25 pages of a book each evening. She wasn't allowed to eat dinner until she could relate to her mother the contents of what she had read. Sometimes my father would tell stories of his wartime escapes, how he and his friends crawled out of the Warsaw ghetto through an underground sewer streaming with rats. He said he hid in the woods and survived there by eating raw eggs that he stole from nearby farms. He hated eggs. In another story, after being conscripted and fighting in both the Russian and Polish armies, he said he snuck away from his unit by getting the MPs drunk on vodka so he could return to his baby son and his wife. But then he wouldn't divulge why or how they had vanished along with all the rest of his family members before he arrived home. When I begged my father to tell me about the many relatives who had disappeared or to explain why there were now only four of us, he would often say nothing. When I asked my mother, she would say, Hitler killed them. If I pressed her for more, she might begin to reply in a low voice, but she would quickly burst into painfully inconsolable bawling, and I would hate myself for setting her off. The questions remained alive inside me, but I learned to stop asking them. The summer before I entered fifth grade, we moved from the East Coast to a Los Angeles neighborhood 
where lots of Jewish Holocaust survivors and their children had made their homes. Six years and many jobs later, my five foot three inch father was hired to work seven days a week as a counter clerk in an all night liquor store. He returned to our apartment every night at 3 a.m. after a two hour long bus ride home. On several dark mornings, he showed up with a black eye or other injuries from fights he had trying to protect the shop owner's cash register and six packs of beer from thieves and drunks. The war had aged him much beyond his years. His job was finally too much for him. He was in his mid fifties the first time his heart stopped. Two years later, he died on the sidewalk in front of a Santa Monica laundromat, lying in the arms of a friend. I was 22 when my sister called to tell me the news. My mother also lived inside the war. She could navigate the world of jobs and strangers somewhat better than my father had, although each encounter with another person invited a likely conflict. She avoided looking at my sister or me unless it was to scan us for something out of place, for signs we were ill or had been harmed, or for evidence that we had been seduced over to the other side and could no longer be trusted. She was quick to parcel out corporal punishment for any suspected misconduct. Yet in her happier moments, she sang in Yiddish or Russian or in wordless rendition of popular songs, filling our home with a voice that was rich, resonant, and unrestrainedly beautiful. As it was in the other daughters' childhood homes, food was the most precious commodity in my family, and it was delicious and plentiful. I loved the taste of my mother's chicken broth, dappled with chunks of sweet carrots and onions, the slippery fat egg noodles she served with thick pieces of her slow-cooked pot roast. Every evening after work, my father brought home a Hershey's chocolate bar in each pocket of his overcoat, one for me and one for my sister because having chocolate was our family symbol of freedom. But my parents were obsessed with our eating enough. My mother insisted that my sister and I each drink a glass of milk and consume something substantial before we went out, whether or not we had just finished a meal. The message was in the treacherous world outside our apartment, we might not get food or drink again for a long time. Other members of our daughter's group described similar family conventions. But for our family, the space inside our apartment wasn't secure either. My father drew closed the blinds on our kitchen windows during dinner. He thought it wasn't safe for anyone to see that we had food or that we were all sitting together as if to gather for a meal was to advertise our vulnerability, as if the sight of us eating would provoke an attack from our enemies. My parents also started to imagine that someone came into the apartment when we weren't there to poison our food or replace it with toxic substitutes. One evening when I was seven years old, I watched my father stand over the kitchen sink, cursing in Yiddish while he poured a container of our milk down the drain. I begged him to stop. No one else's father did things like that. Following this incident, food more than 24 hours old was deemed suspect and thrown away. Decades later, my mother would still pencil an S for Sonia on the bottoms of newly purchased eggs before placing them in the egg tray. She would look for that mark to assure herself that the eggs were okay to cook and to eat for breakfast. As I heard myself describe my parents' violent interactions to the women in the daughter's group, the plates crashing, the punching and slapping, the tale seemed to reach the point of absurdity. When I got to the part in the story about my running into the kitchen to grab the knives, I was laughing uncontrollably. What was even funnier, I added, I began doing this at the age of three. Malka listened deadpan along with the others. No one else was laughing. That's not funny, Sabina, she said gently as if I didn't recognize how often, how awful my situation sounded. Some of the daughter's families had emerged from Europe earlier than my parents had, yet all of them were scarred by war traumas, even those who had left Europe at the very dawn of the disaster. 
all had faced anti-Semitic hatred, had feared for their lives, had lost or lost track of loved ones. And like my mother and father, most had come to the golden land of America as penniless Yiddish speaking immigrants. But these women each had one survivor parent, not two as I did. Their parents had more or less adapted to life after the war. They had put together successful businesses or resumed their educations. In these women's childhood homes above underpinnings of thinly concealed grief, the kitchen plates matched and remained intact. The school clothes fit. They enjoyed quiet meals together, at least sometimes they were quiet. Some took family vacations. Many of their parents had purchased tidy houses near large cities like New York or Los Angeles or Montreal as they aged. The East Coasters wintered in Florida or relocated there permanently. My sister and I never had that kind of home life. My parents spent my childhood fighting the war and my teen years fighting everything else. They didn't retire into a suburban ranch home or a Miami condo with trimmed lawns. Their souls remained as two refugees carrying their satchels from one town, one apartment to another. I had conveyed some of my family's stories to the daughters group at previous meetings. After telling the hiding the knives story that morning and then later listening to their jokes about staying in their parents' Florida condos, I began to understand that my mother and father were more damaged and less adapted than the others, that these women hadn't grown up in an atmosphere filled with as much fear and turmoil as the one my sister and I had. There was another difference too. These women's parents didn't wrestle to hang on to a job and pay the bills like my parents once had and like my mother still did. These realizations disturbed me as I said goodbye and left Malka's apartment at the close of our gathering that afternoon. Why did their parents' lives turn out so differently than mine? Outside in windy gray San Francisco, I zipped up my jacket against the damp air and wandered along the sidewalks of North Beach walking up and down the chilly hills. I usually felt energized after these gatherings with a sense of having found my tribe. This time I felt rattled and lost. I arrived at the corner of Columbus and Broadway. I could have strolled into Vesuvio Cafe for a drink or entered City Lights bookstore next door. I chose City Lights. For me, getting lost in language inside a quiet corner of a bookstore is like joining in community prayer. It's a simultaneously public and private experience, safety among strangers. I needed a bright story of what home could have been like. Music, ideas, people who succeeded at life, adventures that ended happily, a grandmother's lap to curl into. I looked for the Jewish book section. I'd refused to read either personal or historic accounts of Hitler's war because I had lived that war every day. I knew too much and yet I knew nothing at all. Stories had also come to me from friends and classmates whose parents were Holocaust survivors. I had taken for granted that I didn't need books to educate me on this subject. The unspoken mythology in my home had been that both of my parents had somehow escaped Hitler's worst and had remained safely in hiding until the end of the war, even though they had lost all of their loved ones. But now I questioned all of my assumptions. As I stood facing the monolith of City Lights Judaica book section, a book beckoned that was, was neither prayer nor sanctuary. A small paperback, its cover, a brown tinged photograph of crematoria smokestacks found its way into my hands. The Five Chimneys by Olga Lengial. The book contained the testimony of a Czech woman, a non-Jew who had survived Auschwitz-Birkenau. She had voluntarily come to Auschwitz along with her children because she had refused to be separated from her Jewish husband during the Nazi sweeping arrests of Czech Jews. She had no inkling of the nightmare she had chosen to enter until it was too late for her or her children to escape. I cracked the book open to a random spot and read and then skipped to another paragraph, 
somewhere in the middle of another page. No, this can't be. The narrative was so sickening, I could hardly believe the author had lived to put these words on paper. I flipped from one section to another looking for respite. Each sentence I read was worse than the one before it, but I couldn't stop reading until my body began to take over. The words slowly formed distinct images, delayed by their gravity like a movie whose pictures are out of sync with its soundtrack. I became dizzy as I followed the voice of the author to the horrific scenes of her memories. Suddenly I found myself sitting on the floor, propped up by nothing, eyes closed, sick to my stomach, holding the book. When my eyes opened, I didn't know how much time had passed. I gathered myself together and despite the dread I felt, I paid for the book and returned with it to my house in Berkeley. I took in the stories in small doses. There were no easy passages, no let up in the savagery, one unspeakable cruelty after another. At 4 a.m. several mornings later, I woke abruptly, propelled out of a nightmare. Olga Langiel's memoir had given me the frame for the puzzle I had been piecing together for 29 years. My family's disparate stories, the fragments I had heard since my earliest childhood, now had a container. My parents must have survived a concentration camp. I didn't want to admit this, but it was the thing that made the most sense. I had to know. I booked a flight to Los Angeles to confront my mother with this question. My mother, Sonia, was 65, with the liquid eyes and emphysemic lungs of a 90-year-old. Her most stable home had been our apartment in the heart of the Jewish Fairfax Avenue district where I once lived. Many of our neighbors there spoke Yiddish and Russian and Polish as she did. She had made her place in the community, had worked as a sales lady in all five Jewish bakeries within a three block radius, and had been accustomed to walking upstairs each evening to her one bedroom refuge after work. The flat had a well-organized kitchen with enough room for her white formica dinette table and four matching chairs, a picture win window in the living room that she kept spotless, and most important, cross ventilation that sent cooling air through the rooms during hot LA summers. The year before I came to visit her, the building where she had made her home for more than 15 years was sold to a developer. When she refused to leave, the new owner brought the LA County Sheriff to evict her. My sister arranged for her to move into a studio apartment for low-income seniors in a large waffle-shaped building at the west end of West Los Angeles. She acclimated to her new surroundings. The airless elevators, the cigarette stench of the carpets lining floor after floor of identical hallways, the linty coin-operated laundry in the basement. Her now shrunken residence was on the fourth floor, an arc of tiny rooms without separating walls. Her string mop and washing rags aired on the porch overlooking traffic above expensive cars and boutiques she couldn't afford to shop in. The utilitarian kitchen was tucked into one corner, a sink, a refrigerator, a stove, and a few cupboards. It faced the living room that adjoined the bedroom by way of a small step one inside door for privacy led to a bathroom. I got there on a hot day. The glass door to her balcony was open to street noise and a faint breeze. After some preliminary greetings, we sat facing each other on opposite ends of her couch. I asked her point blank, were you and daddy in the camps? She answered, we were in a German camp Auschwitz at the end of the war. And then a breath later, they made guinea pigs out of us. She spoke without emotion, without inflection. I listened to her with a numb, skeptical silence as I had many times before. Throughout my childhood, she had spun contradictory tales on every subject, occasionally changing her story mid-sentence, as if to purposefully confuse me or anyone else who might be listening. She assumed others were listening. How could I believe her this time? 
but this story was different. The deadness of her expression said more than she could have with her usual siren speech. She was not emotionally stable. There wouldn't be much time to ask questions. I had to be careful of the questions I chose. What about daddy? Was daddy there? Your father was sick. I took care of him. Why didn't they put a number on you? They didn't have time. How did you get out? We escaped. We ran in the woods. What did she mean we escaped? No one escaped Auschwitz, did they? The Russians came, they liberated us. Which story was true, that they escaped, that the Russians came? She spoke as if these facts were small gray stones she had saved in a wooden box, put aside for more than three decades, and I had simply tipped the lid of them open. No details were given, no embellishments. She came to life a bit more. She said they were sent to a displaced person's camp after the liberation in a small town near Munich, New Freeman. They stayed there for six months. My father Shia was in love with her. He slept on her doorstep so no other suitors could approach her door. Her aunt Rose, who shared a house with her in the DP camp, convinced my mother to marry him. She had spun this tale before. It was a familiar fragment. But then she told me the exact date she left the camp in Munich, the name of the ship they took and the ports they touched on. They departed from Munich on the 2nd of May in 1946 and boarded the Marina Persch on the 10th in Bremenhofen. On May 22nd, they arrived in New York. I listened, afraid to ask more questions. I knew that at any moment she could explode or become hostile and the conversation would end. I didn't dare ask about her first daughter. She always had the same answer. They burned her. I never knew what she meant. Now I assumed she had meant in a crematorium. What about the rest of our family? She said her younger sister, Rosa, who was 10 years old, and her mother, who is my namesake, were shot and thrown into a pit when the Nazis overran her village. My mother had been attending nursing school in another city when one of the Nazi mobile killing units, the Einsatzgruppen, entered her hometown to gather and slaughter the Jewish community, everyone but the few they imprisoned as slaves. She learned of the demise of her family when she returned home. The neighbors told her they heard people crying and struggling in that pit for two weeks before all the victims fell silent. Her two older brothers got away. She said these last words with a tinge of bitterness. Her brothers didn't stay and protect her sister and her mother, but how could they? My mother said after this, she ran. She didn't say how or where the Nazis caught up with her, but they did. A few more fragments came together. Pieces of glass that had shattered across my childhood reformed into a delicate shell. My parents had endured Auschwitz. My mother and father, they were in that book, in those hideous pages of testimony. And my first little sister, the little ghost of a girl who inhabited our home as if blood ran through her veins for all the adulation my mother had poured into her memory. She was there too. I had no feelings. I heard my mother speak but the meaning of her words hadn't penetrated. Prior to this conversation, the images I had of my parents' war experiences were grotesque trinkets made of dust and shards of memories. The images were fragile, volatile, with curves and corners that had no purpose, no beginning or end. During childhood and adolescence, they would burst open without warning, declarations completely out of context, like they made us drink pee. When I was a little girl, my father told me that my mother had hidden in the coal bin of a train to smuggle herself across the border when the Nazis invaded her country. It was something I should be proud of, I should remember. I barely remembered because nothing made sense about it. I remembered she was brave. 
this alternately smart, screaming, crying woman who was my mother, who was relentless, charming, bitter, and rageful, who trusted no one, who made an art out of playing dumb when that skill was called for, was also impossibly brave. She had buried herself in coal. What happened to daddy's family, I asked her. But this question made her angry. I don't know anything, she glared at me. I was becoming a stranger. But what about, I don't know anything? She was finished, the conversation was over. I wouldn't learn from her what happened in the interceding years between the coal bin and Auschwitz. She said she had been in hiding and somehow married and had a baby. Her first husband died as a soldier. My mother was still and forever in love with her soldier husband. He was so handsome and her baby so beautiful. My father had departed this world seven years earlier, his secrets intact. Now I knew that he had shielded my sister and me from the knowledge of their concentration camp experience. This single thought brought me to the edge of tears, but I held them back. I stood in her tiny kitchen and made lunch for us. One of her favorite Americanized European concoctions, hamburgers made with ground beef, eggs, and Lipton onion soup mix, fried in an inch of oil. My hand slipped and I burned my fingers in the sizzling oil while I was cooking, trying to tend to my mother and watch the burgers at the same time. I didn't dare tell her I was hurt because it would set off an eruption. My fingers throbbed. I ran cold water over them to stop the burning while taking care not to attract attention to what I was doing. The pain and frustration of the situation felt deeply familiar. I left soon after the meal was over. It wasn't until I came home from Los Angeles that the weight of my mother's disclosure hit me. I told my partner, Sherry, about our conversation. She didn't handle the information very well. She thought there was something she had to do to make it go away, to make it all right. She was agitated and impatient with me. Sherry and I fought at home. I said to her, just listen to me. You can't fix it. I just need to talk. But saying this didn't help. She couldn't handle what was happening to me. She didn't know what to do. A few days later, we took a hike with Sherry's younger sister up a trail near Fort Baker overlooking the Golden Gate Bridge. The cement and iron bunkers built into the sides of the hills looked like miniature Nazi crematoria to me. As we ascended, my lungs tightened, my heart raced. The road felt impossibly steep. My legs refused to cooperate. I couldn't keep up with Sherry and her sister. I couldn't look at these military images and I couldn't stop crying. I told them I was heading back down to the shore. They could meet me when they finished their hike. As I came down the ridge, I saw a large troop of mostly blonde haired Boy Scouts in their tan shirted uniforms amassing on the beach. They might've been returning from a from a group conservation project or a hike from a nearby campground. But on this day, the crowd of them looked like a battalion of Hitler youth. I didn't know where to go. I was inside a nightmare. I had no skin to protect me from the impact of these images. I couldn't sort out past from present, my life from my parents' lives. I didn't belong outside or in public. It never occurred to me that maybe I should have remained in the uneasy darkness my father and mother had draped over our family's history. My mother's revelation lit the sky over their past. And in this light, 25 square miles of Nazi barracks encircled with garlands of live electrified barbed wire shuddered into focus. Trapped inside were my beloved parents. Now I wanted to smash the container I had spent 29 years assembling. Sherry and I fought at home. I said to her, you can't fix it. She didn't know how to respond. She wanted to disappear. I swung between weeping and wanting to fight with someone, anyone. One evening during a screaming argument, I hurled my favorite ceramic mug across the kitchen. 
They bounced into the sink and sent blue fragments flying in all directions. The shattering sound eased the knot in my chest. Alone the next day, and for many days after, I grabbed our drinking glasses and coffee cups one at a time, threw them hard into the wall, the backsplash, the porcelain. They showered the counter and floor with broken handles, sparkling shards, and glittering splinters. Thank you. Uh, reading and right now we're going to take a moment to ask our audience here if they will consider has asking some questions at the end of both readings and in a moment we are going to try to put on uh, the screen uh, a way of contacting us with questions if you don't have a YouTube account if you do have a YouTube account you can answer or ask questions on the particular page where you have just witnessed this uh, this great reading. So uh, also, I want to remind you again that our readers have books available, and we'll be talking to you at the end of the second reading uh, about how you can make that, make that purchase. So we're going to move now uh, to uh, from prose to poetry and introduce our next distinguished reader, who is David Axelrod, who hails from Missoula, Montana, and we're delighted to have him here. And uh, David Axelrod has recently published a second collection of nonfiction, The Eclipse I Call Father, colon, Essays on Absence, and his eighth collection of poems, The Open Hand. He wrote the introduction, My Interests Are People, for um, the section about people photographs by Bert Erlinger. Uh, David Axelrod directs the Low Residency MFA and Wilderness Ecology and Community Program at Eastern Oregon University. He also edits Basalt, a journey, a journal of fine and literary arts, and serves on the editorial board of Lynx House Press. And I just want to say, you know, I, I feel privilege to have familiarized myself a little bit with his poetry. And I was just looking at his poem, Just North of the Windy Ridge Fire, um, which has some remarkable images, the apocalyptic glow of dusk, the candle trees rain ashes onto moss, monkey flowers cast a deep hue of yellow and scattered light, a gray cloud fanning out over white sand, the freshet carrying her into the lake, and the calmer diffusions of blue, uh, quite quite remarkable. I'm looking forward also to his reading. So without further ado, we will hear from uh, David Axelrod. Thank you so much. And uh, Sabina, thank you very much for that really stirring uh, story. Uh, I think I know those people. <laughs> Jeez. Um, yeah, so I thought uh, apropos of, of Sabina's reading, I start with a prayer and a dedication. Blessed art thou, the Lord our God, who commands us, construct the luminous from such obdurate materials as were provisioned. Oh, hear, ye people of Pubelbrov. The Lord our God, the Lord is one, and we are nothing more then ephemera drifted into gutters, the soggy debris discarded by others. Praised be thou, ruler of the universe, who gathers us together, glues us like layers of handbills plastered to lampposts, our brains aglow with affirmative light. The words of the, the Gaon of Pubelbrov. Um, and then uh, a poem in, in dedication to whoever is out there. Uh, this is very strange. I don't see anyone but my own bloody self. Uh, and uh, uh, whoever you are, hello, thank you for being here. Uh, um, 
this is, uh, this is uh, for you, dedication. For you who struggled to speak and succumb to muteness, who spalled the chips from flint of wordlessness, who flared, then went dark. For you in whose fields dampness rose from furrows, sun and wind soon dried to dust. For you caught by the gravity of tides and drowned tangled in kelp who felt the maple bull gnarl into a hymn to goat-faced gods unperturbed in heaven. For you who fired the communal oven in the square for the last time, who knead us into God you sang to vacant air, breathe us into dark bread that we may be infinite divided in equal parts shared. For all who found muteness uninhabitable as ice scoured stone, as barren glacial melt, snowfall without laughter of children, who cast off shoals confident abundance glimmered in gunmetal seas, who stood alone like the soloist at the end of music, wailing into the bell, querying air with wounds, who aspired always to a form they were unwilling to yield to, believed in broken cries. You who were the refuse, error and debitage woven into the words, of others. Let us claim some healing now, the possible amplitudes of awe that come around only once in a lifetime, if at all. And I thought, um, apropos of uh, the conditions that persist in the Willamette Valley along the West Coast, I would read uh, some poems about fire season in Eastern Oregon, uh, uh, from which I've recently moved uh, to Western Montana. And uh, today I was uh, saying to the hosts and to Sabina uh, before we started that uh, for dinner, I went and harvested something from the garden and I, it was covered with the ashes of the trees of the Willamette Valley in the coast range. Um, and so uh, I guess this reading is also for that whole ecology uh, I know well and that you live within. As the mountain dreams it. There it is, a glimpse of it anyway, above the intervening ridge, the dome of Glacier Peak and headwaters of five rivers we live alongside of in all our feckless shambles and uproar. Johnny's come lately, ghosts of a language never learned. At dusk, the mountain divides shadows cast by its north facing cirque from Alpenglow lifting along its southwest flank. There it is, the world as the mountain dreams it going on as it went on, going on after as it went on before us. Spikes of elk sedge and calf brain poking through duff at the edge of July snowbanks. A white bark pine nut splitting its seed coat centuries later inside a nutcracker's hoard. The fascicles unfurling five elegant leaves a little asterisk on a mountain that lost its glacier. If people live inside some spectral order, does it matter how or how long we abide here? Does whatever the mountain dreams end without us? 
if it wakes in a world we set afire. Uh, <laughs> well, there's, it's, it's, I was talking to my son today who uh, works uh, as an environmental activist for the uh, uh, Natural Resources Defense Council. And he said, uh, I mean, the problem is, is that it won't go away. This is will persist for everyone. Uh, this is uh, it, it reaches. It's reaching further and further north, and uh, it's not going to go away. And if this is the reality we live with. Um, and uh, it's a little bit daunting, but uh, he grew up, of course, in Eastern Oregon. And uh, I'm going to read a poem about the Okanagan, but. Uh, Geographically, they have a lot in common, uh, similar weather patterns and ecology. Uh, this is called Late August in the Okanagan. In the wake of the fire front, the stench of ashes, skeletal pines. Teenage boys sit inside an idling sedan at the gas station and can't believe their luck. A Salish girl who, though she puts on a hard, brave face, cannot refuse. She stares straight ahead at steers and ponies, seared obscenities, lying on their sides, bloated, dotting paddocks, and pretends she is merciless. We belong to no other family, and this idea of ourselves inside a fireproof house. Think of us sitting here as fire sweeps through cheatgrass, as bitter brush explodes, the heat turning turned back by mud walls and tempered glass. Think of this world that caught fire, each of us crazy to open the door and throw ourselves into flames. <laughs> Thank Henry for reading that other poem, uh, just north of the Windy River, uh, uh, listing some of the images from that, uh, that poem, North of the Windy Ridge Fire. Um, but uh, another poem from later that summer, uh, this is called Soaking the Thirst Bag. In the end, Water, too, had become just another scant standard whereby we reckoned loss. She led the way across ridges, parching winds, a rain of sparks and ash, blackened stands of pine, smoldering windfall. Adrift in manias, we brooded, old feuds billowing ill will, and baleful mind. How could we trust the world soul to thirst still for the dry bladder and wish to soak it all the way through? Listen, she said, to the cold astringent psalm trickling across cobbles. She pointed up the gulch where the North Fork once joined the South at a gravel bar covered in puzzle grass and tear, tears seeping from a cut bank, the past surfacing in the present. She pulled me down beside her, the air sweet with the aroma of buckbrush and mint. We filled the thirst bag with awe, watched it swell, full of losses yet to be born. I am, um, one of the things that is truly distinctive about um, living uh, in Far Eastern Oregon is uh, it really does have a terroir. <laughs> it tastes uh, a certain way. Uh, and uh, food I've grown and eaten here in Montana this year tastes differently, uh, for sure. I water it with different water. 
And um, well, this poem has uh, some connection to what is in the water, uh, the flavors of things. Uh, and this is a, a poem about uh, the Grand Ron Valley called Feedback. Red sky in the morning, and already we're the desert of this place. It's next becoming, and as far as we can see, it still tastes of its first people, dispossession, the places villages burned and grandmothers were hanged from trees for children to see, the places no one goes now. Pray for us. We can't find work. We're old and running out of money. Always packing our bags ready to flee. Then we taste brandy wines tender on the vine. The ordinary sweetness of things grown from basalt and volcanic ash. The flavor of Chinook when the river runs high and cold. And we don't leave. We never will. It's as though something big always balks our getaway. Each July, when everything alive ripens at once. And we say, this tastes of Mount Emily. This, like cricket flats, the Grand Ron Valley, black soil from our garden above a meander the river abandoned 10,000 years ago. Prevailing winds reverse, monsoons stream north late in the day, massing anvil-headed mountains of cloud depleted of rain, not lightning. And overnight, the oak savanna west of here catches fire and the future turns up at dawn. Refugees camped at our curbs, waking dumbstruck inside of their cars. We say we can afford the cost of irrigating at night every summer. All that old water glaciers left, a gift, if not for us, then for whom? From the beginning of this other world. And I think I'll just read a couple of more um, uh, and um, we can call it a day. Um, I might not read that one. It, it, Greg Walden makes, a, makes an appearance, but I think he's stepping away soon. So yeah, there, Thank God for small miracles. So, so he doesn't really <laughs> need to read that one. Um, this is a, a, a called Song of Extinctions. Blue-toed skink, speckled cuckoo, borax vetch, yellow-finned dace, nutcracker pine, Wire cress, Wais penstemon, rock grouse, imnaha, woolly elderberry, sage lettuce, milk lark, horned white bark frog, Roth milkweed, Mary's common blue, checker spot whale, Lahotan swallowtail, aneroid wolverine. Wallawa, blue alder, Cayuse, lamprey, Canton, vole, stolen sun peach, black Republican cherry, love apple, little creek meadow foam, Gillis red squirrel, bridge of the gods dolphin, Grand Ron crow maple, so happy salmon, so happy, Clarkia. So happy, blue wheat grass. I'll end with a, a poem called uh, The Northern Sorrow Monkey. 
who I think I, I conceive of a little bit as being the author of everything that preceded tonight. <laughs> Um, uh, the, the poem begins with a, an epigraph, a rather lengthy epigraph, excuse me, uh, from the Field Guide to North American Monkeys. Simia dolor borealis, rare across its range, prefers highland forests near open water, matrilineal, not gregarious, forms loose-knit groups only when young are present, otherwise solitary, retreats to isolated refuges in mature trees, browses on mistletoe, club moss, horsetail, lungwort, and blueberries where available. Needles of hemlock and red cedar fronds provide important winter forage. Individuals have been observed taking salamanders and tree frogs, Grieve, 1949. Often mistaken for a juvenile yeti, typically silent, though when mating, copulatory vocalizations sound imitative of and sometimes are confused with the melancholy yodels and harsh howls of others with whom it shares its diminishing range. The Northern Sorrow Monkey. We heard it howl from the beach below, and moments later, another answered from crummelts high on the moonlit ridge above. The moon path led away down the glassy wake to falls, we plan to portage days later. Hemlocks in solemn robes stood around us, attentive as we were, startled awake and afraid of those daunted cries. And we remembered a song, a round first learned in kindergarten. No, not now, not for you, probably. Never. The sorrow monkey, brooding in its dwindled sliver of life, crowded out by refugees from a world on fire. Nothing else is possible beyond the already known. There will be no adventuring forth, only hammering back into the familiar hole, no achievement no infinite theorem or hundredth monkey, limits only. The falls are the border never dared, and the range of its roar cascading over cliffs, the moonlit dome of mist, rapids churning below, all remind how the farther a sorrow monkey roves, the louder the overawing rebuke. Thank you so much for your patience and kindness being here today, whoever you are out there. Uh, all the best to you. Wonderful set of readers we've had tonight. And uh, I need to say that I was around when the Lane Literary Guild was formed in 1984. And when uh, Ingrid went and Bill Sweet put it together, and our first one of our first readers was William Stafford. So uh, the two of you just fit so nicely into that tradition of a distinguished uh, literature uh, and moving literature. And we've seen on our our uh, website for YouTube how people have responded to both both of our writers on how um, moving both of them have been. So uh, we're going to turn, you can learn too, uh, you can learn more about the Lane Literary Guild as we flashed up our, our uh, maybe we can have that flash up again, um, learn more about the Lane Literary Guild at um, the wonderful website, www.lanewriters.org. Um, that is our, that is the Lane Writers Network um, that has been formed as a, a webpage and it has 
of interest to all writers, including those involved with the Lane Literary Guild, but of other writers that are going on in the Lane County. So, and as I said, our member spotlight on this particular page is Sabina Stark, and you can read further into her work by visiting that page. Also, uh, we, we wanted to entertain any questions that might come up. I didn't actually see any on our YouTube page. I need to defer to um, Matthias here and see if he's had anything come up. Matthias, have you had anything come up at all? I guess not. So what I would like to do now would be uh, for me to ask just one question of each of our writers tonight and uh, one for Sabina and I have one for David and you have the option of not answering. <laughs> but uh, for Sabina, I had a question about um, your reading. Uh, when when we're involved with memoir, it seems like there, and this person is writing memoir, family memoir, and there are many, many, many episodes that come in, many, many episodes that come in. And I was wondering, uh, what, what do you do uh, when you, uh, to connect those episodes? Is there some particular thread that you come up with or how do you work with that? Um, that's a great question, um, and you know this isn't a uh, autobiography in the sense of you know cradle to grave. Um, uh, it's so I, I explore particular themes, and that's and that's helped me to guide uh, which stories are relevant and which stories are not relevant. Um, so I, that's and it comes very nicely into because he's because he cohesive whole. So that's great. And and for David, I I just had uh, one question too. And is it? It seems to me you, the poetry your poetry has a certain incantatory quality to it. And I was wondering is is that based in a sense in a religious sense or is it a sense that comes from observation of nature or uh, or would you agree that your your poetry has a certain incantatory uh, nature to it well uh, I, I like hearing that that that's how you hear it <laughs> that's, that's good news I, I I can't say that it was it's in it's it's intended um, uh -huh. I think it, it is um, maybe how I've learned to hear language uh, um, I mean, uh, I suppose um, I, I grew up around histrionic people who like to perform poetry <laughs> un, unasked uh, and, uh, you know, at the dinner table, that sort of thing. And uh, uh, there are certain writers, I suppose, that they were fond of, uh, like Dylan Thomas, for example. People do great imitations of Dylan Thomas. Uh, I think uh, probably as a very young child, that sort of thing really um, started tuning my ear toward a certain kind of music. And, um, and I suppose too, uh, uh, as I've, uh, uh, I don't know whether I should say matured or aged, uh, I, um, I feel more strongly about the song-like qualities of poetry, uh, maybe than I ever did before. That's great. Um, I just want to want to note that it's been said on our web page about both of you people how how moving you both have been and and how it's uh, approached grief in such a such a wonderful way. And um, I, I think that given our times right now, that that's just that's definitely a gift coming from both of you. So thank you both very much. And uh, Matthias, you had something at the bottom of our page that you were going to give us again. Was it? Were you going to put another banner under there? Yes, that uh, you can find books by tonight's readers at Tsunami Books. And uh, we have. Yay, <laughs> What's that? Yay, Tsunami Books. Hey. <laughs> and we, we have a phone number um, somewhere here that I can, I can read to you and you can just give them a call or you can go to their website 
They have a nice website, but the phone number for Tsunami Books is 541-345-8986. So you could get in touch with them. Um, we are very grateful to Tsunami Books because they have been a place where our, our critique groups have been able to meet too. And so they, they really help build our literary community. Okay, well, I'm gonna close, clo I'm sorry. That's true. They, they bookstores, they do that. They, yeah, that's for that are a fanish, unfortunately a fanish, vanishing breed. So we really want to support them. Um, I want to I want to close tonight by just uh, encouraging you all to come again to our series. Um, next month, uh, October 20th, uh, we'll have Melissa Kwasny um, out of Montana. And we also have Christopher Howell. Uh, uh, out of Eastern Washington. And that's, that'll be, again, it'll be at 6 p.m. on the third Tuesday, October 20th. On November 17th, we will have, um, which is Tuesday to the third, we'll have Austin Gray reading his prose. Um, I'm a little bit prejudiced because he's my husband. And uh, I encourage you to come to that. And he'll be reading with Shirley Perez West, her wonderful prose uh, as well. In Jan, we'll be skipping December, and in January 19th, we'll have D Diane Dugall uh, reading prose, and she'll be reading with her wife, Amanda Powell, who will be reading poetry. So uh, I want to thank you again. Henry. Uh, uh, Henry. Yeah. yeah. This is Matthias. Um, yeah, we did receive one question. Uh, we did receive one question directly to my email. Oh, okay, great. Uh, and I want to follow up on that one. So somebody sent an email directly to me at my city email address, mtorres at eugene-or.gov. And let me see if I can uh, kind of uh, translate that question the best I can. Um, it says, uh, well, I'll just read it word for word. Okay. Um, David, uh, my great grandparents settled in the Grand Ronde Valley a while back, a great place. I have discussed with fellow poets whether today's poetry has an obligation to engage with current issues or can go its separate way. Auden and Morrell thought a separate path was best. Ginsburg, Rich, and others were much more engaged on the ground. What are your thoughts about this in our uniquely strange well, Let's time? not forgive Auden for being taught, uh, for, uh, not being topical because he was topical all the time <laughs> uh, in his own way as topical as uh, as Audrey and Rich I suppose um, I I don't know that anyone has to feel any bloody obligation at all uh, to be one thing or another uh, I can speak for myself and just say that there are times when um, uh, uh, social pressures impinge upon us uh, and uh, you, you, you have to uh, you have to find some way to make a space in your work for these topics uh, and I mean that apropos of what's happening now but if if you if you feel somehow not obliged to do that then there's no need to be so. Um, uh, I, 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 I worry sometimes about maybe being too detached from um, social matters. And so, I, you know, I, I, I certainly am uh, um, always thinking about what, what, what's the realm of the possible here and how can one uh, find a language to address what's happening to others uh, in their own lives, in their own context, in a way that seems genuine and not just gratuitous. Uh, um, and so, you know, that's the that's the real trick is uh, <laughs> being genuine. Thank you, David. We have one other Thank you, question. Sabina. Uh, Henry, here, and it's for Sabina. Uh, Ingrid Wendt would like to know about uh, more about the anthology that you're in. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Oh. Okay, um, so uh, <clears throat> I, I, I believe that, um, that Tsunami Books will be able to get um, this. Uh, I was very lucky to be included in the, a beautiful anthology um, called Before There's Nowhere to Stand. 
and it's a, a compilation of, uh, of poetry from Palestinians and Jews um, addressing directly the situation that's going on in Israel and Palestine. And uh, there's a, a richness, um, a deep communication of the situation. And I really very much, I'm, I, I'm included in that anthology and so is Ingrid Wendt, but I would encourage you to read. There's so many strong pieces and um, it's, it's published by Lost Horse Press. And it's definitely a book that can be ordered through Tsunami Bookstore. It's called I the have it, right? <laughs> now, before there is nowhere to stand. Well, thank you um, to both of you again. And uh, yeah, absolutely. And and I would I would I would encourage you encourage both of you to to visit uh, YouTube site and see all the adulatory commentary that's come from your reading, which is all well deserved. Did, Matthias, did you have any final comments? Um, yeah, just. Uh, yeah, Windfall Reading Series, we're so grateful to partner with, with uh, the Literary Guild um, uh, on this program. It's it's year after year, it such a, makes a, such a profound impact um, uh, for our programming here at the library and in the community. And uh, thank you, David, Sabina, and everybody that everybody that's watching tonight, thank you very much for make, continuing to make the, this an engaging program. Um, I would also encourage you to visit the Eugene Public Library website to see all of our other programs that are there as well that, um, you know, went for reading series uh, again. Um, thank you. And David and Sabina, thank you very much for, uh, for reading with us tonight. Um, uh, let me see if there's any more questions. And that should perhaps close I it out. I want to say while he's looking, uh, many thanks to the, the Eugene Public Library and also to KLCC, which for the past week has featured the windfall series and has told everyone about this reading tonight. That, All right. um, we're, we're good to go. Yeah. Right. yeah. It's just, it's a thank okay. you to David thank for you. answering the question yeah. from good the night. Evening. All right. Thank you very much. Night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We're signing off here and